Hi, my name is Brian Sweeney. I'm the articles editor of Texas Monthly, and welcome to TexasMonthly.com. Executive editor Skip Hollinsworth has written a cover story for the November 2007 issue on presidential daughter Jenna Bush. Yes, that Jenna Bush, the one so famous for underage possessions and my favorite a few years back, sticking her tongue out at the White House press corps while on the back seat of a limousine. Skip, is this the young woman that you found for your profile? What, what is she like today? Well, the point of the story is how she has gone from this caricature that was presented of her by the media that in her freshman year of college, she pulled three little stunts. She first sent Secret Service agents to Fort Worth to pick up one of her boyfriends who had been thrown in jail up there for underage drinking at a TCU fraternity bar. And you sort of laughed at that. I mean, it, you admired her chut spot. There's for, guts there. For, yeah. for sending off the Secret Service agents. <laughs> Then she persuaded her Secret Service agents to stay outside the Cheers shop bar on 6th Street while she and a friend walked in and had drinks. Unfortunately for her, there were two undercover officers in there who immediately uh, hauled her away for minor in possession charge, so she got a citation for that. And so you would think she would have learned her lesson, but no. In May of the end of her freshman year, Barbara comes back, and Jenna and Barbara go to, uh, Barbara comes back from Yale, and Jenna and Barbara, Jenna finishing her first year at UT, celebrating the end of their freshman year, go to Chewy's, this restaurant in, on South, in South Austin, which the Washington Post says is known for its uh, mediocre food and killer margaritas, and they order margaritas and tequila shots, and they get busted again. And so they both get citations, the Secret Service agents are sitting outside, it's this wild comic scene, and that was sort of what made Jenna's reputation that stayed for a long time. But all that made Jenna uh, sort of the object of late night comedian jokes, and when Jenna and Barbara got popped for a minor in possession charge for the drinking incident at Chewy's, uh, then you know the late night comedians called them everything from Jenna and Tonic to a J and B, to uh, David Letterman told jokes about him like, uh, I mean, she, they became constant punchlines. Right. Like, um, uh, he would tell the jokes like, uh, uh, President Bush gave a really boring State of the Union address. It was so boring that Ted Kennedy sent drinks over to the Bush twins. <laughs> and that would be sort of who Jenna Bush was. And it became sort of ingrained upon us that this was the party girl. And that this was the girl that, you know, was taking her place among some of the infamous presidential daughters right. of the past who had had their share of hijinks, like Teddy Roosevelt's daughter, Alice, who used to sneak up on top of the White House roof and smoke cigarettes in defiance of her father. Or Nellie Grant, Ulysses Grant's uh, daughter, who uh, dated every man single and married in Washington back in the 1800s. And we thought, okay, well, this agenda is going to be one more of these. And then something changed. And what changed was that um, she decided to, th that unbeknownst to the media that had just sort of written her off, Jenna had majored in English at UT with high grades. She had uh, gone on to become a school teacher in an urban area of Washington, D.C., a poor area. And she took an internship with UNICEF in, the, in Latin America, where she decided to... Um, uh, write stories for their website and as part of interviewing somebody she came across this girl, Anna a fake name, but that's who it was this girl in one of the Latin American countries who uh, was suffering from HIV and Anna gave a speech at a meeting of, of people afflicted with HIV about I am not dying from HIV I'm living with it and Jenna burst out in tears and it was sort of this defining moment for her and what she did was sort of classic Bush. Instead of going back and telling people, this was a wonderful moment for me, a sort of eye-opening experience about how the other half lives, she decided to write a book about it. And, you know, the head of UNICEF in Latin America, when she told the head what she wanted to do, said, you got to be kidding. To himself. I mean, he wouldn't say it to the president's daughter. He said, you got to be kidding. Uh, what if the book is terrible? And how do you tell the uh, first daughter, no, the book really shouldn't be published? And Jenna went to work and was obsessive about it and said this is going to be her sort of statement as a way to make kids in America realize what children in third world countries go through. And so that's sort of where the story leads to, is this book that's coming out now that uh, HarperCollins is publishing it and is so impressed that it's published 500,000 copies. Mm -hmm. Huge for a first print. Right.
Have you read the book? Yes. What do you think about it? There's been a lot of talk that, oh, it's in fact so good that there's no way that she could have written it, which seems a bit unfair. What is well, your well, reaction to it? Well, the rumors began immediately that she had a, a ghostwriter, right. or that she had fictionalized most of it, or um, that, you know, she's 20, she was 25 years old. The only thing she had written prior to this was some poems and some term papers in college. And um, the fact is, because I really wanted to see if this was true. She wrote it herself, according to everyone. She did all the interviews herself. There was no ghostwriter. She did very specific interviews to create scenes right. to make the narrative work. And Bryant, she is a very fluid, facile writer. For someone coming out of the gate that young to write a book so accomplished, she writes deftly, quick sentences. She doesn't get tangled up in her words. She's fast. And, you know, teenagers are going to love that kind of right. writing style. Maybe we should hire her. Well, that would mean I would lose my job, so don't do it. <laughs> we'll see about that. The, the headline of the story is Girl Gone Mild, so the, obviously the whole notion is what we thought that we knew about her from the tabloids and the college days is in fact a, a moot point at this point. She's 25 years old, she has a college degree, she's written this book, the job that she took in D.C. teaching at an elementary school paid $36,000 a year, so she is in fact an adult now. Do you think it was unfair the way the media portrayed her? Is that just a, a byproduct of what sort of the media age is in that we're, na that we're in now? Yeah. You had talked about, for example, Roosevelt's daughter. Certainly the media has changed in the way that it's going to cover people like this. Or did some of it she bring on herself? Um, well, you have to question why she went back after getting hit one time with an MIP and the publicity it caused then that she tried it a second right. time. Uh, but she has, in fact, uh, really emerged as a very competent, funny, feisty, articulate young woman uh, who is, you know, no matter how hard of a question you asked her, she had to come back immediately. She was never flustered. She uh, is extremely poised. And uh, she has a great sense of humor, like her dad. And all of this you saw firsthand. firsthand. I mean, what, what was your access like? Well, you know, when we heard the book was coming out, we and a lot of other media outlets tried to see if we could get an interview. And she gave a few interviews. She did an hour with Diane Sawyer on ABC. She did a half hour with Ann Curry on the Today Show. She did Larry King. She did, uh, you know, some other television talk shows. She did an interview for People magazine, a, a quick interview for the Washington Post. But she gave us at Texas Monthly three days. I, you know, I had a long dinner with her, which is the opening scene of the story. I had a, um, I spent a day watching her in school, and we talked through the day, and then we had coffee the next morning, and um, that's actually for a figure of, of that from that kind of family and of that level of influence a, a lot of time. Right, right. And so we got to go through a lot of issues, and I got to watch her sort of interact with kids and other people. I see. And it really turned out, you know, to be the kind of access you sort of dream of. Right, right. As you were writing it, did you have a sense or did you think at all that people's understanding of her may well come at the expense of how they see her father? Was that anything that you thought about as writing the book, that regardless of who she is as a person, because of how they feel about him as president, that may cast a shadow over it? Yeah. When I did the interview with Jenna, the first day I met her, the poll came out saying that President Bush had the lowest, second lowest disapproval rating in the history of modern polling of presidential politics. So, I mean, here is her father who is being bombarded left and right. And, you know, she's at a point where she tells me she doesn't read the newspapers, watch news, anything, because it's so critical of her father. Right. And this is the father she remembers who took her to soccer games and cheered when she got confused and scored a goal in the wrong team's net. And she loves that image of George Bush as her father. Right. And George Bush as the embattled president brings her to tears when right. she talks about it. And so that's how she internalizes that. Is there any sense, even at the age of 25, that she herself is interested in politics? Is that anything that's on her horizon? Or? She has a very adamant no to right. that answer. And the fact is that she's a really smart political animal. When The one time she got, himself, got involved in the presidential campaign was her dad's re-election run in 2000. Mm -hmm. and she went on the campaign circuit and gave speeches and she was very funny she told jokes about her dad she had great sort of anecdotes about his character and uh, 
People loved her. Right. People loved right. her. And she's very good doing, if you saw the television interview she's done, she's very good uh, on camera, and she's a good speaker, and she's good at the top of her head. But no, the answer is no, no, absolutely no. no. Even though now she's engaged to somebody who, in fact, does have a connection to Republican politics. Well, and he's supposed to be a smart kid. His name's Henry Hager. His dad was the lieutenant governor of Virginia. Henry met Jenna when Henry was working as an intern in Karl Rove's office. Uh, if you, it all comes if you full dislike circle. Karl Rove right. and you think Karl Rove is this sort of wicked mastermind of whatever, you need to remember that Henry has his own personality. Like he played these clips of Dave Chappelle, the black comedian, acting like President Bush <laughs> for the Bush family one night at dinner. Nice. So he's a feisty guy himself. Gotcha. They could be a good political couple. Right. Still to be determined. Great, great. All right. Thanks a lot. This was great. And thank you for watching. Uh, again, the November issue is on newsstands right now. Go out and pick it up. Or better yet, don't even get out of your chair. Just click on the subscribe link on the website where you can get full access to all the feature stories in the current issue as well as our archives. Thank you.